Shall we begin? Okay. So uh, thank you very much, everybody, for joining us for this last component of BOSC. Before we have closing remarks, we have this really wonderful panel. And uh, I'm Jason Williams. You see me enough already. Uh, and this is about actually a, a wonderful group of experts and uh, both scientists and persons. Uh, and I was just saying uh, that I think we have a group, uh, a combination of people and experiences here that is uh, probably has never been at this conference or very few conferences. So we have a lot to learn. And this is really meant to be interactive. Obviously, I'm going to start off with some introductions. Um, but we really want you to come to the microphone and ask your questions as well. Uh, so if you haven't had a chance or a little bit shy, please uh, don't be. Uh, please uh, think about uh, coming up and giving us uh, some of your thoughts and reflections. And then also, um, you know, maybe even after the panel, if you didn't quite want to ask uh, in front of everybody else. Um, one of the things that's really important, I can speak now with my hat on, although I don't know you see my hats. Uh, I could speak as uh, one of the organizers of BASC is that we really think about the conference every single year as an opportunity, especially for new projects and people who are new to the community, new to the, new to the group. How can you walk away from this, changing the way that you do your work? And so obviously, scientifically, uh, the collaborations and the talks, uh, you've gotten that component uh, quite well. We had wonderful uh, two days here. But the other thing is the community building. And uh, the, off, the, the thing that I was thinking about when coming up with this panel is that just the way that you know, people make software, if you don't maintain that software, uh, eventually it, it's not going to be useful anymore, even though you put so much effort and you had the big win when you actually did that. And I thought the same is actually can be true for diversity because there's a lot of emphasis on the diversity. There's all these comments, oh, we need to be diverse, we need to be inclusive. And then you can make certain wins, so, so to speak, that you can do certain things. You can have your first contributor if you're on a software project from someone from a group that you've never really interacted with or a person you've never really had within your community. But then do they stay? Do they grow? Do you grow together? Uh, so the, 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 the relationship that we're uh, talking about there is the same one uh, that we need to think about in many aspects of our lives. So that's enough of me uh, speaking. I'm just going to ask uh, every uh, panelist now to give us about two minutes. I'll sort of keep you on track if you're more than that. Uh, just introducing themselves, giving a little bit about their work professionally and any context that they wish to share. We'll have a couple of questions and then we'll look to hear from you. So we're going to start with uh, Gary McDowell. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Gary. Um, so my, my background is uh, originally in biomedical sciences. Um, and I came over to the US to postdoc. I'm originally from Northern Ireland. Um, and as I was going through the system of postdoctoral research, I became more interested in the system of how we train people and how we educate people in science and what, what is now being called meta science or the science of science. Um, and I also was very interested in advocating for early career researchers and helping to amplify their voices and the, the experiences they were having. So um, I ended up co founding and running a nonprofit for three years called Future of Research. Um, where we were trying to build that community of early career researchers and give them a voice and have conferences and, and bring those voices in and amplify them. Um, and then since then, I've been working as a, essentially a freelance academic uh, consultant. Um, I have a very scattered portfolio, but uh, the, the common theme is always thinking about early career researchers, thinking about training. Um, you know, my passion is trying to think about how to help people reach their potential to solve problems um, as scientists or through science. Um, and to help help them navigate, to, to help create a system or, or modify the system to, to focus on people and focus on their success. Um, so that's sort of where, where I've been. Um, aside from the nonprofit, I think one of the, the major projects I'm on that it's relevant is I'm on the steering committee for a National Science Foundation um, research coordination network that focuses on bringing social scientists, biology educators, and uh, biology researchers together focusing on creating inclusive spaces in biology education and sharing back best practices and uh, and building a sort of interdisciplinary community. So thanks. Uh, hi, I'm Rachel. Um, I'm working at the Institut Pasteur in Paris. Um, I'm French, so sorry for the accent. Um, so uh, I started my career as a lab technician and uh, then switch to bioinformatic uh, and then switch again 
to uh, web development and UX design. So now I'm more on the web design side. And, uh, and since I am uh, come from a family where uh, gender question was uh, a big uh, subject of discussion, <laughs> um, I have been aware of that kind of issue early in my life. And, um, and since I'm at the Institute Pasteur, uh, I was the first woman recruited in a team of uh, men. And uh, I feel the need to have those kind of um, safe place where women can speak uh, freely and, uh, and empower a bit. So I, as soon as we recruit more and more women in the team, we build up a, a little community and uh, we started to have those kind of feminist cafe where we were talking about a random subject, but mostly feminism. And, uh, and growing and growing, we um, try to officialize a bit the things and change the feminist cafe into a DIE uh, at Pasteur community, which is a non-official <laughs> uh, community because we don't have like the agreement from our heads, but we don't really care. We are <laughs> we are two thousand two hundred now uh, in this uh, community. So I think it was a need. So we are super happy how it grows, and we hope it grows and get official one day. And we push a bit for that, and to maybe we have, have an association, uh, and uh, and with uh, some of my colleagues, we started a project to try to observe. Uh, question asking behavior during conferences and this is what i i presented uh, uh, yesterday so uh starting from a random talk on a on a small uh, paper we did like a research project so this is one of the things that i've done i think it's all <laughs> thank you Rachel. I'm Monica Muñoz Torres and I'm an associate professor at the University of Colorado Anschutz Medical Campus and when I came to the United States many over two decades ago, um, I started graduate school in a, a place that in the south of the United States where there were only two other Latin American students. And I wanted to leave the place with a little bit more Latin American knowledge and uh, went and knocked on the door of the graduate school dean and said, what's up? <laughs> Let's get some people in. So. Since then, uh, by the time I left, there were 40 uh, graduate students from Latin America in, in uh, a foundation that was the first southeastern chapter of the Society for the Advancement of Chicanos, Latinos in America, and uh, Native Americans in Science in the southeastern United States. And since then, I've continued to look for the ways in which we can increase the diversity of the workforce in the biomedical sciences. Uh, by training, I'm a plant research geneticist uh, that turned arthropod genomicist, turned computational biologist. And, and in the biomedical field, I'm hoping to continue that work. Uh, as of late, I, I have tried to work with efforts of increasing diversity and inclusion at the ISCB with BOSC, with the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health. And uh, just last month, I started in the uh, Chancellor's Leadership Council at my campus. Thank you. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Janae. Um, I'm uh, going into my fourth year now at Penn as a PhD candidate in genomics and comp bio. I did my undergrad in biology and computer science at the University of Dayton. And um, ever since kind of like navigating that process into graduate school, I've really been focused on ways to maintain and build community. Um, so, um, like, like going through like my research experiences as an undergraduate, really having the right mentorship was something that was important to me. Um, but what I was lacking when I finally got to graduate school was seeing other women that looked like me and kind of understood more of the cultural intersections that come along with not just being in graduate school, but you know studying some of the topics that we're diving into, particularly within things like genetics, um, genomics, race, medicine. Um, so I was really looking forward to kind of finding a community um, that would kind of reflect what I was interested in. Um, 
didn't find one. I Googled how many black women had degrees even in computational biology and bioinformatics. Nothing came up. Um, I, I mean, on, along my kind of like my interview trail, I met um, one other person. Um, so I kind of realized I probably had a good opportunity to build something that didn't already exist. Um, so that's where the um, black women in computational biology network um, came into fruition. Um, since my first year, um, we kind of started out as just like a group chat in a Google sheet of just a few people um, spreading the word on Twitter. Um, and now we're up to over 200 members uh, across the globe from at least four continents um, at all professional levels. We have undergraduates, we have um, senior scientists, faculty, you know, directors and in industry and such. And so it's been really great to um, be part of that and now be part of the um, community that's not just run by me, but is truly um, run by other people um, who are looking to, to build those connections. Um, so I'm excited to learn about what other people are, are doing and, and, and share more of our story as well. First, I just want to say uh, that the folks here, man, this is really cool. Um, and thanks to all of you who are willing to prioritize this and come and be here at the end, towards the end of the day. Um, thank you very much. Um, I'm Andrew Hazley. I am currently a teaching postdoctoral scholar at North Carolina State University. So I teach biotechnology, which means some, some fundamental molecular biology skills, with lab and, and conceptual in the, in, in the what we call lecture, but I don't lecture. Um, and uh, also working with uh, bringing some environmental DNA analysis stuff into that, bringing some bioinformatics into that curriculum and, and helping with that. Um, but uh, just to give you a little bit of a, a, of a background on where I can come from in terms of the perspective I can share. So I have been legally blind since birth. I have a little bit of central vision here in the middle, not much peripheral. Um, and I was, I came up through the United States K-12 uh, primary secondary education system. So no school for the blind, none of that. Um, not that there's anything particularly wrong with it, but the approach that my parents took was there are no workplaces for the blind um, and there are no environments for the blind. You, you need to be mainstreamed from the beginning. Um, and so uh, we came up through that, discovered an interest in science, pushed to be able to pursue that interest in science because it's one thing to turn my English textbook into Braille, it's another thing to make your lab work for me. Um, and uh, I actually, I, I hate to say this to this group, I grew up kind of disliking computers a lot because I was so dependent on them. And, and so when people are like, oh, do you really like computers? Well, I don't know, do you really like your pencil? Uh, it was kind of my, my feeling. Um, that changed, obviously, um, <laughs> around grad school because the kinds of questions that I was interested in um, started involving that kind of stuff. So I went to a small private liberal arts college, um, exchanged some bells and whistles in terms of accommodation for being able to talk directly to the people that I was going to be learning from, and, and we worked together and we made it work. Um, did a PhD in genetics right up the street, UW-Madison. Um, that's where the computation stuff really came in, did a lot of transcript doping analysis type things, some image analysis and processing and some of that stuff. Uh, taught myself Perl and Python out of books um, and uh, kind of went from there and, and still interested in that work. But I also discovered at that time that I, something else that I didn't think I was interested in, which was teaching and education. And people started asking me, hey, how would I make this accessible? How would I make that accessible? How would I make that accessible? And I was like, oh, wait, I actually can help with that. And then I discovered universal design for learning as something that actually had evidence behind it and science of, of teaching and learning and how people learn. Um, and so I got really interested in that. Did it, worked on UDL in the private sector with a group called BioQuest that some of you may be familiar with. I was their assistant director for their UDL initiative for a while. Um, and then uh, went on to the current teaching job I have now. So I can talk to you about the education side of the DEI piece. I can talk to you about the visually impaired part of the DEI piece. Um, and, and that's sort of where I can, can come from for you. Uh, you can hold on to the microphone. Uh -huh. uh, it'll, yeah. it'll get passed uh, okay. according to you. And I'll also just note that I have the, the app open. So for anybody online or anybody wants to do a Q&A that way, um, you can certainly do that. I'll try to make sure those questions are relayed. So. 
I, I'll take the privilege of starting with a question. I really don't know what to ask because there's so many uh, that I could ask and then really encourage everybody to just go up to the microphone. Um, and also, if even though you're, you might be sitting in the audience, <laughs> uh, you can also have a comment this time <laughs> if you really, if you have a perspective that you, that, that you feel comfortable sharing, uh, you know, just because you're not up on the stage doesn't mean that you can't also contribute in that way. Uh, so the first question that comes to mind, let me try to uh, structure the question in a way that's appropriate for all audiences. Um, the question that I would have is, uh, you know, try, trying to, the theme that we had, the question I have is, have you, and this is, you know, totally up to you, you could actually all refuse my question. Um, <laughs> have you been in a situation or, you know, uh, how would you, how would, if you have, how, how did you react to it? Where at first you thought you were welcome in the space and you thought, oh, okay, I'm going to try this or let me go for this. Or you weren't even thinking about inclusion or being welcome or something. You just showed up to a space because you were interested in it. And then you started to realize that actually you weren't as welcome as you thought, or you weren't taken seriously or whatever the situation was. Because um, when we talk about, again, uh, inclusion and diversity and, and in trying to meet new people and understand their experiences, their culture, their background, their expertise, we can do certain things to paint that picture that we're doing it, but actually the culture change takes a long time for everybody. Uh, it can't happen overnight, it can't be perfect, but if it's not genuine, or if it's really not what you thought it was, uh, so you may need to think about that. But have you have you had that experience where the intention of the situation, if it, even if it was good, ultimately it just turned bad? <laughs> because I think the the lesson that we all want, and and don't think that I'm not included in that, right? In, in one space, we may be the majority, and we may be the people that have the power. But in the next space, it may be it may be different, you know. What, what are the things that have indicated to you that, you know what, this, this group or this people is not really ready for me uh, and they're gonna need to do work <laughs> because we can't see that sometimes about ourselves. So does anybody have any thoughts or comments on situations like that or you know, just trying to get into, you know, what was, was there a case or a place for you? I see all oh, so many heads nodding, so just gonna <laughs> give it away and we'll stay on this topic for about seven minutes. All right, I can be really quick on this one. In this example, I'm going to keep fairly vague because I don't want to call anybody out uh, directly or any groups out directly. But um, I have in the past been in situations at least twice where I was at a presentation or a workshop that was supposed to be about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I walk in and they are doing fantastic things and talking about really cool stuff that I really want to learn more about and all this stuff. No provision of slides. Um, having people read things to themselves off the slides, um, using this, that, here, there, as you can see on this point, um, completely inaccessible to me. And I'm going, okay, so this is DEI, but for the things that you think about with DEI. Um, and, and, um, I've had that happen in a couple, a couple situations and that's what immediately comes to mind. And I will be quiet and pass it along here to Janine. Uh, I mean, I, I think that sort of speaks to when we talk about DEI, people have like a certain thing, often it's race or often it's gender and that there are so many things that aren't thought about. I mean, my experience is actually very different. It's ageism, I guess which is I was doing work representing early career researchers and there was this weird period where it was myself and Jessica Polka, if you're familiar with Jessica who runs ASAP Bio, um, we used to joke that apparently we were the only two postdocs in the US because every committee for like a two year period or every group was like, oh, we need to have Gary and Jessica on things because they're the <laughs> ones who talk about postdoc things. Yeah. And then we, you know, we sort of spun this into a project later because the, there's a difference between inclusion and tokenism, right? And having someone on a group to be like, well, we have this person here from this population. And so we have done, we have done diversity, strictly true, but we have not done inclusion and we've certainly not done equity or social justice. So it's, it's, um, you know, I find it was this very frustrating thing of having to not only represent all postdocs who are an incredibly diverse group, 
um, but also I'm trying to do all the reading for like what each group is, you know, experiencing and like trying to represent every single group, but then also realizing that only certain things would be picked up and they're like, oh, I actually don't want to hear what you're saying. And so that I think is an experience that lots of us from lots of different groups um, have like experienced on like committees or participating in things, right? And so there is, that gets to the real tough question of how do you, we, we would sort of talk about the table was built for other people, right? It's not just about bringing people to the table, but basically like rebuilding the table once you have new people there. Because it was built, it was built for people who like look like me, by people who look like me, right? And so, so I feel more comfort in certain perspectives with certain aspects of my identity. And then, you know, as you move away from that, it becomes more uncomfortable. And then you have to do more work to make sure you're actually authentically bringing people in. Um, do we, are we still in? <laughs> um, and then we'll move on to another. another sounds back. good. Two quick things came to mind when you were asking that question. I remember visiting this, again, like Andrew won't reveal details, <laughs> but I remember visiting this conference that had uh, hundreds of people in it and had a, a very, what seemed to be a very intentional and pur purposeful, a, let's make sure everybody is is accounted not just from the the standpoint of increasing diversity and participation but also from the data themselves right like the things that we're collecting and uh and and you know there was all of this diatribe about it and then we showed up and for five hours i listened to 13 white men giving talks and one woman at in the middle and that was that and i felt very inadequate uh, and made some call to arms and about four years later finally uh, a diversity group sprouted out of that um, but it was very yeah very surprising i just want to read a comment since somebody has decided to share a comment and you know sort of saying their experience of being the only female faculty in a computer science department uh, and losing vision in one eye and then and gaining it after over many years she talks about that's really important uh, from, for her. Uh, the thing that was important was building internal resilience and self-confidence and knowing herself because that was the building block to know to ask for what she needed. And it, but it becomes tiresome and wearisome to have to ask over and over again. Um, maybe the flip side of that uh, question, which is when have you gone to, what spaces have you gone to or what are the characteristics of spaces or collaborations that you participated in where actually you do feel included, not just there because quote unquote diversity was needed. What are some of the things or, or what are some of the ways that are really signaling that, oh, this community or this group really is serious about it? Or what are some of the things that you've appreciated when you've gone? And, and maybe sometimes even the thing you've appreciated was an apology that somebody thought they were trying to do something right and they know they didn't get it right and they, they approached you and said, oh, I'm trying this and I'm sorry. Uh, what are some things that actually signal to you that, oh, okay, this is a relationship that will work. This is a collaboration that will work. So I'll leave you to think and see who wants to answer or take a stab at what are some of the things that people can work on and or do that really signal that it's a, it's authentic. Yeah, I think I'll just kind of build off of what others have shared, um, just even from the negative experiences is kind of go into the positive. Being in those situations where you, maybe you do call out, hey, everyone on this panel, it looks the same, comes from the same background, the same type of school, the same you know, pedigree, or um, there, there's no representation here. So if you're someone like me, just a little PhD student who musters up the, the courage to even say anything in the first place, and then people, there's like two reactions. One is, okay, well, we don't, we don't have any like resources or we can't fix that right now. The other is, okay, wh what do you suggest? Or if you don't feel like doing the emotional labor, you know, where can we, where can we look out um, for, for resources or opportunities to improve? If it's not now, then it's later. And I feel like I've had many more positive relationships or partnerships come from, you know, the latter interaction where people listen, um, people um, kind of, you know, if, if I'm not representing entire, an entire community at once, then um, they're at least open to, um, to uh, taking, taking initiative in the future um, and including people that, 
you know, need to be included. I do my best wherever I go to kind of highlight, you know, the other people that I work with, um, you know, give credit to people in my communities um, so that those names can continue to circulate. And I've already seen a lot of those benefits happen in some seminar series and speaker invites and things like that. Um, so I, I, I think um, by kind of holding on to and uplifting your own ecosystem while maintaining integrity and also making sure the people that you're working with are, are worth your time. And um, also just understanding and recognizing your needs. Sometimes um, when you are presented with um, controversial or I guess um, negative experiences, uh, I think for me personally, I've just had to understand when to pick my battles but also understand like, when there are opportunities um, for improvement that could benefit you know, the broader community. Um, so I think sometimes, um, particularly as um, scientists of color or from minoritized backgrounds in general, um, we have this, this weight or like sometimes this feeling of responsibility to fix, um, but that's not necessarily the case. And if you're working with the right allies, people who are willing to listen, um, then that, that way can be equally shared um, and, and prog prog progress can be made. So um, that's what I'm still learning. Do you have yeah, go ahead. I want to be really careful not to take too much space here. Um, one thing that is going to this is going to sound kind of trite, um, but, but I'm serious. When I, some of the times where I felt the most included and the most heard and that the things that I care about are valued by the people that I'm working with around me is when they're willing to spend money on it. And, and that's not always an easy thing to do. Um, and it doesn't have to be money at time because time is money when they're willing to put people's time, parts of people's positions into that. And so, for example, when I was working with BioQuest, um, that started out as being invited to come and give a presentation about a tool I had developed to teach uh, phylog phylogenies uh, in a tactile way. And I'd worked with some cool people to do that. And that was the first workshop. And then people valued it. So the next time I was asked to come back and actually be uh, someone who was a resource at that uh, week-long workshop to help people incorporate UDL stuff into the things that they were developing. Um, and that was asked of me and people at the meeting wanted to hear about that and really wanted to do something. And it wasn't always like, oh, that's really interesting. And then they'd walk away. They'd be like, okay, so that thing that you told me yesterday, here, I kind of drafted something and I tried to do it. What do you think? And, and that was, it felt valued because they realized that it wasn't just about me. It wasn't just about blind people. It wasn't just about disabled people. It was about making things better for everybody. And they were willing to the organization was investing time and money in making that part of what they did. Um, so I, um, so we started uh, our little group of women in a team of a uh, of lot of men, and uh, and we we noticed really soon in the process of building a, a community that uh, being. Uh, Numerous could be nice to, uh, as uh, Jenna said, don't take all the load on us. And uh, and I think we are now a bit more mature in our small group, uh, but still young in our community. And uh, this um, uh, seed that we started with a small group of women that are really uh, dedicated to to the cause, uh, help to uh, support all the challenges that we faced so far, and uh, and we take the load uh, one after another, and uh, and it makes the the pass so much easier uh, because when some are tired about fighting and uh, and doing the job again and again, uh, there is some other uh, there to cheer. Uh, which helps, uh, or to take the lead on the different questions. So I think this is uh, one thing that we uh, did quite well, is uh, having a base of people that are motivated when they have time, when they want to, <laughs> and, uh, and it helped us to 
uh, start slowly and uh, hopefully go really far. So uh, I think this is one thing that we quite did well when we started. I have one last question. And again, again remind you to go up to the uh, mic if you do have ones and we're gonna keep, I'm fine with awkward silences and waiting. So we're gonna, we're gonna make that happen. But here's a question that's coming to mind as I'm thinking about it. And it's something that I think um, is very relatable. And I, I, what I'm thinking about is power imbalances. And what I mean by this and, and, and structures, what I mean by this, and I think it's something that both conferences have in common, but also even software development projects would have in common. For us, for all of us to come to a conference, it was a fiscal effort, right? There's money and privilege that goes in the ability to be able to come in person, right? And then also um, when you come to a conference, it's a structure, you know, especially if you're new to that conference, you probably have no say over what abstracts get accepted, how thing, how decisions are made. Uh, and I think different conferences and have different cultures about how decisions are made and whether things are transparent or not, or whether you feel that, you know, as a, as a graduate student, are you as accepted and welcomed and listened to as somebody who's more senior? Um, but it also could be the knowledge imbalance of not knowing a software library, but you wanna to contribute to a project and you're like nervous about being able to do that. Um, how have you seen, whether you were welcome to a conference or whether you were welcome to a software project for those of you who are developers, how have you seen ways in which uh, those spaces have worked to make sure that people who are new and are coming with less power, less knowledge because they haven't been part of it, have you seen ways in which people have done things that made you say, oh, this looks like a safe place. <laughs> this looks like they will value my contribution even if I make a mistake. Or this looks like, hey, if I come to the conference, I'll find a space to present my work in a way that's field value. Have you, have you experienced things like that? Or do you have tips or things that you look for uh, that signal to you that these are places that you, you can enter, even if you know that entry is going to be as somebody who's never been there before and you're, you know, what does that make you think of? Do you have any, any feedback on that? Because that's something we're all interested in as people in this room make decisions about both of those things. Um, I will go shortly since I have the mic. <laughs> uh, and since last week I was on another conference in France, I, I can a bit compare what I so differently there and here. Uh, for, for example, I'm really happy here to see that there is a code of conduct that is uh, um, displayed on the screen all over. Uh, I don't know if it has a big impact, but it's a difference that we don't have that uh, in the conference where I was uh, last week. And also a tiny detail, but uh, there is a unisex toilet here. Uh, which I really appreciate as much as I took a picture because this is something that I don't see uh, in France. So this is two little things that I appreciate when I came here and uh, and also like having a lot of more diverse uh, uh, speakers and, uh, and attendees. That was nice. <laughs> I will share something that I am very happy about, very excited about. Um, they don't pay me, so I'm talking about them again, but they don't pay me. It's the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health. Um, so four years ago, as a newbie to this community, it was very much jump in the water and try to do something about it and, and then just spend the next six months trying to figure out what, what, what meeting, where do I go and what standard? And now, all of this time later, they have taken the time to very intentionally welcome people so that there is some thought of uh, not only a feeling of you know, nurturing a, a welcoming environment, but also nurturing a, an environment that keeps you. And so in the, in the spirit of retention, they created a buddy program. When you come into the GA4GH now, you are matched with a person who is uh, in, well, it could be in the same uh, work stream. So they, they develop standards in, in work streams. And so you can, you are uh, to say, hi, this person is your welcomer. You meet once with them so that they share with you, not like, oh, here's a presentation about the, the workshop, but rather here's how meetings go. This is the place where you can go and contribute. This is a good place to start or, you know, and then you can keep in communication with this person to try to hand hold you through some of the processes and, uh, and because we know that it's not a perfect uh, process, then they're actually doing after six months or 12 months have gone by, they interview the person who just came in and said, did you find it useful? What can we do? Um, so I think that that was a, it's a really good process. 
Anybody else? Andrew? So Jason's question got me thinking about the open source communities overall. And something that I've often thought about that's really interesting is sort of by design, and not always on purpose, but a lot of the open source uh, effort in, especially in software development, is run on volunteering. Um, but in order to volunteer, you have to have a day job. And so there's some privilege tied up in being able to volunteer. And I'm not saying anything anybody doesn't already know. But what it makes me think about when you talk about power dynamics and things like that is if you want to diversify who's developing the open source software, the pools of where you're pulling your volunteers from have to be diverse. And now we have a chicken and the egg problem. <laughs> Um, you know, and, and I will use myself as an example, not as a, as a pity party. I'm 38 years old. I have a PhD, five years of work experience, and I still don't have a permanent job and I am not unique. And so that, that is the kind of thing where if we're serious about diversity, we actually really need to start looking at how we fund this stuff. Um, and so Bosk stepped up. I mean, I needed their help to, to financially get here and they made it happen. And they should be commended for that. Um, and, and they've done that for other people as well. And they should be proud of it, uh, them and ISMB. So that, that type of thing is something that we need to think about as an ethos is it's going to be pretty hard to diversify if the group of people that we come, we are, we're pulling from isn't diverse. And uh, we have a question from the audience, not the last, I'm sure, but please go ahead. Do you need to tap it and just make sure it's on or make sure it's loud or get close? All to right. It? Is that working now? Yes. Great. Awesome. Okay. So this is slightly, slightly off course from the previous questions, but I was wondering how do you work to establish equitable research when you're involving research subjects from a community that might be suspicious of the scientific community, whether because of past or current injustice or inequity issues um, as an autistic person, for example, the autistic community is very, very suspicious of a lot of research and treatments and stuff that's coming from scientific research. Um, so I guess I wonder, how do we encourage researchers to take these groups into consideration when they're planning the scope and design of their research? I mean, um... I think, so this is the thing that like tribal colleges experience and HBCUs experience, like everyone is like, oh, we wanna have you as like our population to work with. And it has to be like authentic participation from those groups right from the start. Like they have to be co-investigators. They have to be in the leadership. I think that's the, 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 most, the most basic part. And then it's a, how to get to that place is like, I think the trickier question. And the establishment of trust, I think you have to start with the building of the relationship first in some like very clear way of what can we do to help you listening in particular, like having listening sessions of like, here's what we're thinking of, but we really want to know what it is. And again, like compensating. I'm really glad that Andrew keeps bringing up money because usually I'm the person who's bringing up money. So I'm like glad to hear there's, that money is coming up from other people. Um, but yes, like thinking about what are the ways that we can like meaningfully actually contribute. And, you know, many of these groups are also like in the academic system trying to, you know, th there are patient populations, for example, in certain groups, but there's also a lot of people who are also in their own right, like trying to further their own careers and move forward. And there's a lot of reporting of people having their like ideas taken and, you know, being used by someone else and getting not proper credit. So it's, it really has to be thinking about building the proper relationship in a like really genuine way. I, I, I wanted to add to that and sort of almost say that, you know, if you have any chance and not that you shouldn't do it anyway, and you know, in any reason, but to me, it seems uh, that those researchers or those groups should actually be supporting uh, the community or communities uh, whether or not they might work with them, but especially if they know that they might work with them. So how are they spending money at the local high school to help the kids do something? It's not, not at all related to their research or how are they supporting uh, some of the work networks like black women in computational biology? How are you doing that first? So that later on when you actually do wanna collaborate, 
you actually can you already have the relationship, not as like, you know, some donor who's just asking for something, but actually you've, you've met these people, you've worked with them, you've asked how you could support them, even in a very small way, but you have some relationship versus you plan the grant. And then I've seen it happen like a week before, you know, it's, it's admission time. Okay. Uh, call them and write them in or call them and, and put them, put them on this. And it's like, that's not the right way to do it. Uh, other comments or thoughts? I just wanted to throw that in there. I just, I just said this a couple of days ago and, and made me think exactly this. It's, it's not about bringing everyone to the table for the conversation is moving the table over to them and having the conversation in their own environment. Uh, looks, do we have another comment or question there? Yeah, Please. yeah. just here's, this is a question. Um, many of you have experience building communities and I guess a thought that I have is just, it seems really difficult to start that. So I'm curious, what are your suggestions for, what are the important things to keep in mind, especially at the beginning? And maybe like, for example, there is no money, we're just starting something, right? What are your suggestions for how to initiate the process of building a community? Yeah, so um, at least for me, I was learning how to build a website and do things like while I was taking classes and things like that. It's actually not that difficult, but it's it's been um, something that um, has been an integral part of the, I guess, communication piece. Um, like at first I was kind of just DMing people saying, hey, I have this Google sheet. Um, do you want to put your name on it? But um, it, was, it was really important to have accessible visual representation of like my vision as well, of what I was hoping that the community could be. Um, I think it was really, uh, it was, it was um, easier to get people excited about what I was doing, at least um, future members, because everyone had been looking for something like this. I always get that comment oh, I wish I had this five years ago or when I was in training or whatever. Um, but it's like, I spent a lot of time on the recruitment aspect, um, but what was has been a little bit more of a challenge because I wanna do it right, not because it's um, because of anything else, was actually building community virtually um, during a pandemic, but also um, across so many different cultures, um, across, across different languages um, and really um, kind of opening the doors to, to different people, particularly across our um, diaspora. Um, so I think um, allowing people to see themselves within the community already, for instance, I get a lot of questions from um, black women in like Brazil or different countries in Africa or different countries like throughout Europe about like um, can they do this or this how can they get involved are there peep members you know already in in the community um, but so I think I kind of what was challenging for me was to kind of just open up and broaden the perspective of what I of like my U.S. based mind of um, you know, what the community could look like, but also, um, you know, there are different training trajectories, there are different, you know, I guess qualifications for jobs, just so many different things that I hadn't thought about um, that I just kind of had to open myself up to learn along the way. Um, so I think on top of me just kind of having, you know, the physical bells and whistle there, there and, and everything, I think it was also kind of a cultural awakening of, of what community looks like in different perspectives from different um, people's backgrounds um, and really kind of learning that language of, of being welcoming and opening um, and like not just trying to sell someone a product, which people kind of tend to put that perspective on the network of, of it being like a business. I'm not trying to sell people cookies. I'm trying to <laughs> welcome people into something that I, I find very important and um, that they value as well, you know? Um, so I hope that, hope that answers the question. Is, is it okay to ask or, or do you want to move on and other time questions? Uh, 
Uh, let's take yours because I want to get it. We're almost going to wrap okay. up, so I want to get as All many right. as we can. Thank, thank yeah. you. So, uh, hi, I'm Ido Friedberg. I'm, I'm also conference uh, co-chair here. So I'd, I'd like to first thank you very much for, for holding this panel. It's, it's incredibly important. And uh, as a former uh, board member of ISCB, uh, maybe future too, I don't know yet, uh, <laughs> I, I, uh, I very much, uh, I think I speak for everybody on, on the um, ICB um, that that we really like very much appreciate this, and and we want to learn a lot. So it's, it's great that you're here. And I have a very specific question that relates to inclusivity in a conference, and specifically to what we've seen here going on the past few days. So when COVID, is this working? So when COVID uh, started, uh, and we all went online, uh, one can call it server lining we discovered was that hey we're getting a lot more people from countries that and demographics that usually do not get represented this is actually a good thing if we can say anything good about it um and, and that was great and uh, now we're back here in person but hybrid and uh, a lot of people that i talk to think this is good except you know we want to ditch the platform that is so a lot of people think, no, this is inherently not a good thing. Uh, this inclusivity is, uh, this is too much of an inclusive thing. I don't want to say whether to paraphrase them in a way that is uh, derogatory. Basically, a lot of people think that I talk to say we should actually just go in person and, and so on because, you know, I don't want to fly 21, 21 hours to, to, to hear David Baker talk to me in person. And so my question is, I think my personal opinion is we should move hybrid and try to make it as smooth for everybody as possible but the con but we will not be able to sustain this for long in the way that it's going on now because there's a lot of pushback so how do we increase um i guess um awareness that this inclusivity is a good thing and and is really good for for everybody because we are kind of at an inflection point right now. I, I, I hope I made myself clear. I'm sorry. If you need any clarifications, <laughs> I'm here. Either way. I will say that um, I think part of it is that it's new and it's a challenge. And so props for trying. Um, I think one thing, I'll tell you something that I tell, that I used to tell a lot of faculty when I did professional development for universal design for learning. What are your learning goals? So in this context, we're the conference goals. And that's how you sell it to people. You say, our goal is to do A, B, C, D, E, F, G in no particular order. And the only way to really do goals C and F are if we're hybrid. So if we value those goals, that's what we got to do. And I think if you, if you just make, if there's anything I've learned, inclusivity for the sake of inclusivity is great from an ethical and moral standpoint, and that should be enough, but it's not always. And so the way to sell it, if we have to talk about it that way, although I agree with you that that's unfortunate language. Yeah, it is unfortunate language, no, but that's but, exactly what, yeah. what I'll be looking for next week in the post mortem <laughs> discussion we're going to have. But, yeah, so thank the, you for being so blunt. Yeah, the way you sell it and the way you describe and the way you justify it, the way you show people why it has value, let's put it that way. The way you put value on it is by saying, look, part of our goal with this conference is to be as international as we can be. Uh, part of our goal for this conference is sustainability right? Things like that. Then we got to be hybrid. Um, th th that, that's just spitballing, but that's the, the process to go through is figure out what are your goals and then figure out where the hybrid aligns with those. Maybe we have time for one more short perspective in, in answering that. Um, so uh, as I said, I, I have been lucky enough to work on conference and online conference and in real life conference. Um, so part of the job work we saw where we were following two years of conference in 2020 and 2021, who happened to be uh, online. And we saw an uh, increase of women participation uh, during those online conferences. 
And as soon as we came back to the real life, we came back to the real life. Women's Attend Less uh, at the 2022 edition of uh, Jrobim, the conference where we are observing. So definitely uh, doing nothing to keep this uh, inclusion was, uh, was something that have a bad, bad impact on the back to real life. Uh, so I think uh, as uh, Andrew says, fixing the goal is, is good. Like if we say we want something that is more inclusive and more diverse, I don't see people complaining about that, or I hope those people don't need to be here. And um, <laughs> so maybe maybe if, uh, if it's well communicated, if it's well said, and now we can have a few numbers, like when we do it online, we have those stuff that are better and we when do it uh, in real life it's those stuff that are maybe not that great so after people can do the calculation and, and decide what they want so yeah and just a quick show of hands for our panelists how many of you is this your first coming to an ISMB meeting okay so uh, seeing them come again and again every year I'm not saying that that's the only metric but seeing new people come and seeing it, seeing that diversity switch. Some years you, you'll come in person, some years you, you might not. I mean, uh, I think that you're absolutely right. The idea of putting the value on it and showing it's something that we really value as a society. So I wanna thank all the panelists for being incredibly generous with their time and with their expertise and what they were able to share. Uh, I wish we had another hour, <laughs> but we do all have other things. As you said, we have a day job. Uh, that we have to get back to. So I wanna uh, ask the audience, uh, please join me in thanking them. And then we'll have some closing remarks from our chair.